Welcome everyone. This is Jeff Archer and I am the Communication Director for the Center for Community Change. We are truly excited to present the results of this year-long project today. And I am very heartened that we had over 300 RSVPs for the presentation and we currently have a large number of people joining, but uh, for the sake of time, I want to get started. Um, I would like to take just a few minutes to set a context um, for this work before I hand it off to our two uh, truly stellar researchers. In 2014, CCC launched a long-term initiative to confront poverty in America. The center is aiming to galvanize a social movement to generate the strategies, leaders, and moral urgency to confront poverty. Early on, we realized that building a movement which requires empowering low-income people themselves to become the leaders in that movement faces quite significant language and messaging barriers. First of all, we knew from years of organizing work, thousands of house and community meetings over the years, that existing language and frames simply do not inspire low-income people to take action. Quite simply, low-income people did not and do not currently see themselves in the dominant language that is used particularly by politicians and advocates. Second, we also knew that much of our language reinforces the paradigms in which blame often falls on low-income people themselves. Intentionally or unintentionally, it cues people to assume those who are poor are lazy or flawed. Because little existing research attempted to address these questions, we decided to start from scratch methodologically. The question we asked ourselves was, what messages could we find that move low-income people to action are deeply progressive in challenging individual cognitive support for the dominant conservative paradigms about our economy, that build common identity for the purpose of asserting political power, and that diffuse key obstacles such as race and gender discrimination that often interfere with our ability to have a common understanding of the economy. Thus, we focused on low-income people themselves and began with listening sessions, not seeking reactions to language that we already had in mind. Rather, these were uncovering sessions designed to elicit how people really think about the issues and what kind of language they use in their ordinary lives. We also decided that an effective message had to lead to action amongst those who are most disempowered. So rather than testing a modicum of preference, we set a high bar. We tested a $15 minimum wage. We tested whether people would hold the sign or whether they would take some other kind of action based upon the various messages. And we also tested racially and diverse senders of the message because we are very committed to having low-income people themselves be the messengers in much of our work. The results of this process have been extraordinary. In my experience, it's really truly original and powerful. Original in that it really gives new insights and powerful in that we believe the new principles about how to talk about the barriers in our economy that trap one-third of Americans at 200 percent of the poverty line or less are, are, are evidences that have not been uncovered by other recent uh, messaging research processes. And the exciting thing is the language not only inspires the base, but it's more progressive than any language I have seen tested this robustly. So before we begin, two quick things about logistics. Uh, there was a four-page summary sent, uh, emailed to every person who registered for the webinar. That PDF, uh, you, you may, if you have, if you have your email in front of you, will uh, gives you sort of a cheat sheet for, that summarizes much of what we're going to be talking about today. Secondly, because we have such a large number of people, uh, I would encourage you to ask your questions to us by text uh, while we are going. And then at the end, when we get to the question section, I will pull those questions up um, and put them to our panel. You will see a box to the right side of your webinar toolkit that simply is labeled questions. Once you type your question in, in, 
the send button will highlight and you can just click it and we will have your question and put it to our panelists when, the, um, when we reach the question session. So now it's time to get started. Uh, Annette Shanker Osario is a communication expert, researcher, and political pundit who brought us into the world of cognitive linguistic and whose approach and way of thinking was really tailor-made for this project uh, as we set out to undertake it. And I think you're really going to be um, impressed by the level of deep thinking that, un that was undertaken um, in this process of uncovering. She is joined by Solinda Lake who hardly needs an introduction. She's universally acknowledged as one of the leading message researchers in America and the go-to expert in democratic political circles. Anna, get us started. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're sitting and watching this. Uh, I first of all just want to thank all of you for finding the time to join us. I know time is hard to come by. We really appreciate it. But more than anything, I really, really want to thank CCC. Um, they are and have continued to be the platonic ideal of a client. Uh, you couldn't dream up a better partner for undertaking this kind of a huge, robust project, which has been almost a year in the making. Um, if there was a crazy idea, they were like, try it. If there was a wild new way of doing it, they weren't shying away, and they really uh, remain committed to the most robust sharing of this information, and it's just it's a delight to work with them. And um, working with Celinda is just amazing. She's a thought partner. She's a leader. Um, she's an incredible person. And also, I want to acknowledge um, her colleague at Lake Research Partners, Jonathan Voss, who's really seminal in driving this whole train. And with that, um, let's dig in. So oftentimes when we get started in talking about a messaging project, you will have someone who sounds kind of like me tell you that we need to meet people where they are. If we were in a room together, I'd make you do a show of hands. We'll do a virtual show of hands. In fact, I would posit to you that that is absolute nonsense for a variety of reasons. First of all, where people are on our issues, and especially this one with regards to economic justice and poverty, is simply unacceptable. We cannot meet people where they are. We need to uncover where they're capable of going and figure out what it is we need to say to bring them there. The second reason is that there is actually no place that people are. People are capable of toggling between multiple even seemingly contradictory perspectives in almost the same instance. Just as on this slide, you're seeing a visual metaphor for seeing from two different sides. What's going on in our brains is that we're intentionally in a sense-making process, attempting to make order and come to judgments about what surrounds us. And the kinds of ideas and concepts that we pull upon in order to make order are guided by what we say to people, what we show to people. And so again, it's our job as communicators to toggle people into the most progressive mindset that they can hold and to keep them there. And we have tools at our disposal to do this. We have ways of seeking and measuring how people make sense and come to judgments. So just as one minor example that comes up all the time, we know that when we unconsciously prime people with really large numbers and with money-related concepts and words, they become more selfish. A person who's been unconsciously primed with numbers will let, be less likely to help the experimenter pick up pencils that he or she drops. A money-primed undergrad will, place, will want to be alone more. So what we know is that when we begin our conversations, whether they be about poverty or whether they be about academic inequity or health disparities, with these really large numbers of which we are very fond, we are actually draining blood from people's cerebral cort from people's amygdala and bringing it up into their cerebral cortex, which is the part of the brain that's responsible for rational assessment. Do I agree? Do I disagree? What's her evidence? What have I heard her say before? When we consider the status quo, which was our first piece, as Jeff mentioned, in trying to get at this puzzle of how do we actually have a discourse of poverty that would move people to action toward the progressive policy solutions we favor, we notice, again, as Jeff noted, that 
if we believe in social movement theory, we know that just as there's no women's rights movement without women, and there's no LGBT movement without LGBT folks, and um, just as the immigrant rights movement is rightly led and dominated by the voices of the most affected community, we can't have a real successful movement on behalf of poor people without the poor. And so there was a hope that there could be a reclamation of the terminology, that there could be, in a sense, the way that queer has now become a, a you know a accepted and empowering identity or undocumented, unafraid. But what we found, as you will soon see and probably won't surprise you, is the extent to which people are incredibly alienated from that terminology. So the language of the poor, even when qualified as working poor, or working class, or low income, is really not resonating for the people that we need delivering these messages and feeling empowered and organized around them. One of the other key challenges and considerations and I say this now pointedly, especially as many of us are working incredibly on low-wage worker organizing, is that the way that we frame our asks for a higher wage, as you can see on the image here, can't survive on 725, raise the minimum wage, hard work deserves fair pay, or my absolute favorite phrase to pick on, hard work should be rewarded as if a paycheck were a diamond ring. Oh, look at that. There it is on the ground. Who, who would have thought? What we do with these kinds of phrases is we eclipse from view, inadvertently, of course, the fact that the reason that there is money to pay people is because of work. So just as down here in this cartoon below, we have George Bush. I, I apologize for not giving you a trigger warning that you'd be looking at George Bush today. Uh, that we have George Bush with his prosperity turkey. We're not meant to presume that the hard-hatted laborer to his right produces turkey, because that's not what hard-hatted laborers do, right? And so we're trapped in this conversation where money comes from origin unknown or from the magical mystery pocket of the business owner, and the worker asks for more of it. And if the boss gives it, then he or she is a nice person. And if they don't, then they're a jerk. And that's it. That's the end of the conversation. Because we haven't established at the outset that the money to pay people comes from their work and is, in fact, not a reward. Another element that we see um, as a challenge in the status quo discourse is a tendency to talk and, and importantly and make gains that are really, really phenomenal and outstanding, deserve to be celebrated around the minimum wage. But of course we know that when we actually speak with folks who are hovering at below or dangerously close to the poverty line, what they're struggling with is not just wages, but rather irregular hours, unpredictable hours, you know, scheduling that happens at a moment's notice. And so we risk with this becoming a victim of our own success, because as we see minimum wage hikes, as we saw in Seattle, and I fully believe, because I believe that we will win, as we begin to see across our country, we will look like whiners if we then go back and say, wait, wait, no, actually what we meant was we need this and this and this. People will say, wait, you asked for a minimum wage hike and that's what you got. What we really need to be asking for is an adequate paycheck. Another issue going on, and this is really endemic to all of progressive communication, I cannot recall a project I have ever worked on in which this was not an issue, is a tendency to eclipse from view the actors who cause the problems and sometimes even eclipse from view the people who are harmed by them. So we have wealth evaporating or wages are falling and we're facing a crisis and we saw an increase and jobs disappeared and so on and so forth. And what's wrong with these constructions is that we know that if we don't establish at the outset that a problem is person-made, that it was created by human agents making decisions, then we cannot establish the fact that it could be human fixed. Just as it makes no sense for me to ask my congresswoman to pass a law that it be low tide at 10 a.m. because I want to take my kids to the tide pool, it doesn't make sense to ask for laws about things that appear to fall from the sky. When we go at a deeper level and we unpack how people unconsciously reason, one of the best tools in our arsenal is something we call conceptual metaphor. These aren't exactly the metaphors you were tortured with in eighth grade, but they're closely related. 
So when we look at how a key component of this language is articulated, and of course here I'm talking about inequality, we have a tendency to talk about inequality, as you see here um, on the right-hand side of the screen, as horizontal distance. This is evoked most often with the three-letter word gap, right? So we have a gap between rich and poor, or we have an achievement gap in education, we have health disparity, um, and we have a chasm, and it's widening. Barbara Ehrenreich once poetically extended this to say it's, grand, it's grown to Grand Canyon-esque proportions. What happens with the gap, this kind of language, is that it is all what and no why. It tells us thing A is different than thing B. Thing A is on the west side, thing B is on the east side, but it's absolutely silent about origin. And what we know is that when we don't tell people an origin story, they fill one in for themselves. And unfortunately, the story they're too likely to tell is that, of course, one person is rich and another is poor. One person is really, really smart and talented and hardworking, and the other one is not. When we bring people into a lab, and we're actually in the process of doing this experimentation, we've already been through um, a first round with a professor of psychology at Oberlin, Paul Thibodeau, we see that when people are primed with the notion that inequality is a gap, when we talk about a gap between rich and poor, 75% of them conclude that inequality is not a problem for the economy overall, and 25% conclude that it is. When instead we introduce the metaphor that you can see here on the left of internal imbalance, if you think of sort of a gyroscope off kilter or off balance distortions in the economy, we see a complete reversal. 75% of people who have had inequality described to them in that way conclude that it is a problem for the economy overall, and only 25% conclude it's not. Other metaphors that are playing out in this space, one of the most common is to liken poverty to an opponent. Now, granted, some of the language data was collected uh, during the 50th anniversary of the war on poverty, so I'm sure that there was more of it than would be in another time, but this is a very, very popular and common form of talking about poverty. So here is this external thing. We can't really tell anything about what it's like to be in poverty. It comes from sort of origin unknown, or it comes from its mommy and daddy, if, if, if you want to be a little bit in jest, and we sort of fight with it. The problem with this metaphor is, again, it doesn't tell us anything about what it is like to be in poverty. It speaks about poverty as its own powerful agent, as opposed to a set of decisions that we made. In contrast, when we speak about poverty as container, we very much profile the notion of it being an externally imposed condition that a person experiences, and experiences as something unpleasant. Because even if you don't sort of get the depth or the true kind of containment of poverty, all of us have been stuck even in something benign like traffic, and we know that it is unpleasant and it sucks and it's not sort of of our own making. So as Jeff mentioned, this was a multi-phase process. After we did the um, after we did uh, the language analysis, which you guys saw some highlights of just just now, uh, we went through and did 14 listening sessions with people at or below the poverty line. Um, and we also did uh, 25 advocate interviews to really call from folks like you, like, like the folks on this phone, and in fact, some of you probably literally <laughs> the folks on this phone, to pull apart how do you reason unconsciously about poverty? What, it is, it, what is it that you assume about the origin of wealth, the origin of poverty, and what kinds of policies we can put into place and what they would do? And with that, I will turn it over to my uh, good friend and incredible colleague, Celinda, to talk about the part you're probably most eager to hear, which is the numbers, how it all worked out. <laughs> well, thank you, Anat, so much. And I want to thank, I want to just echo what Anat said, which is um, the tremendous uh, insight, leadership, and courage of CCC and Jeff in particular in leading this effort. And I think you've already seen what an enormous addition uh, this uh, kind of analysis, this cognitive uh, linguistic analysis gives to all of our efforts. Um, and there is no greater 
a partner in this than Anat. And I want to thank our team, led by Jonathan Vaught. So we took the messages that came out of all of these sessions and the informal focus groups that you did, and we did dial testing. And we did dials, um, and you can see on the next slide, we did dials with 1,000 registered voters. And uh, I really want to commend also CCC for putting the resources in to really look, and the funders of CCC, to look at this among a variety of groups. But we looked at it among 400 people below the federal poverty line, over samples of African Americans, Latinos, and people under 30, and a sample of advocates. Because as uh, Anat said, we were very committed in this process that if you don't have brand advocates, if the ad advocates won't cover it, carry the message. And then, frankly, it doesn't resonate with the people that we're trying to help and are trying to help themselves, the folks below poverty, then it makes no sense to have this as messaging. We looked at initial beliefs. We looked at underlying core values to divide people uh, and to look at people by base, persuadable, and the opponent's base. We looked at preferred labels. We looked at the opposition's messages. And we looked at our messages. And we also did fascinating experiments with looking at the actual uh, race and gender of the messenger. So looking at the interaction of the message and the messenger. All of the data that you will see in a moment came from the total sample. So all of those oversamples are weighted down. But it allowed us to break apart and make sure that these messages were working across the board. So the uh, first thing that we looked at were, uh, was the language. And um, we found uh, that there are three things about the labels that were very important. First of all, as a not mentioned, poverty, poor, don't work at all. Even the poor don't want to be called poor. Um, and those kinds of uh, language uh, just really negatively resonating. And the public is numb and unresponsive to helping poor people, helping people get out of poverty. We did find uh, two real breakthroughs in terms of uh, labeling. One was labels that refer to specific lived experience rather than abstract or identity type uh, situations. That's not always true, but it was key in this effort, particularly around the economy. And again, as uh, Anat said, we're trying to trigger a bigger set of thinking here that has an origin and um, an opponent, someone who's created the situation, and then someone uh, ourselves who can remedy this situation. So talking about real lived experience, can't make ends meet, living on the brink, working to provide for family, we're very positive. Now, in many areas, we find that uh, people also uh, say that positive labels are better than negative labels. And that is often true. It was not true in this situation. Um, actually, the negative labels outperformed the positive labels. And that's because these negative labels describe a set of experiences that people could really relate to. The next thing we did was measure initial attitudes. And we measured initial core beliefs uh, because we wanted to look at movement <coughs> over time. And we wanted to be able to divide people into base, persuadable, and opposition based on their core attitudes and values, not just based on a momentary question. So we asked people, do you favor a government role to help uh, people in poverty and uh, to help people out of poverty? And we started out with 73% of the people in favor of that. We then said, even we repeated the same question, but asked it even if it meant increasing your taxes. And people are very, very tax sensitive right now. And we lowered the percentage in favor of those policies that they had just committed to by 30 points. And in fact, we went from people being 53 points in favor of the idea to um, seven points opposed to the idea. And we went to intensity being on our side by 3 to 1 to intensity being on their side by 2 to 1. So a really, really dramatic effect and a real warning here of one of the issues we have to deal with, which is 
tax sensitivity of uh, people around these issues. The second thing we looked at was willingness to take personal action. 49% said they would be likely to take personal action around this issue. Only 16% said that they would be very willing to take action. And one of our goals here was to look at how to create more activists. And then, as Jeff mentioned, we pushed the envelopes on policies. We tried to look, um, as Anat said, not where people are today, but where we want to get them. And frankly, we want to get them beyond uh, where they are today. And so we looked for support at different policies, including uh, minimum wage and uh, at $15 an hour. And we had 51% in favor of increasing minimum wage and, and saying that they would vote for it. So we looked at these core attitudes uh, to look at where the public was and then re-examine how they move and use these questions to actually look at uh, the different subgroups within the population. Well, Matt, I'll turn it back to you. Great. So like most conversations about poverty, this one begins with Miracle Whip. Any idea out there, if you think silently to yourselves or talk, if, if you're in rooms with other people, why I would be subjecting you to a picture of Miracle Whip uh, today. Okay. And the reason is because Kraft Foods, Miracle Whip, spends 90 cents of every one of its advertising dollars on the people it calls its super heavy users. So these are people who only buy Miracle Whip, always buy Miracle Whip, and can be counted upon to reliably purchase Miracle Whip. Now, why would you spend 90 cents of your dollar on the people you not only have, but you will never lose? Well, it's because they are your brand advocates in the parlance of marketing. These are the people who will, and I'm not kidding you, bake a chocolate cake with Miracle Whip, bring it to a picnic, have their friends say, this is moist and delicious. What's in it? Would you believe Miracle Whip? That's disgusting, but I'm strangely intrigued. They will do your work for you. They will spread the gospel of Miracle Whip because what Kraft Foods and many marketers understand is the base is the best messenger of the message. If your words don't spread, if you'll forgive the pun, your words don't work. And that is something we have paid too little attention to on our side. In fact, uh, for me, it is summed up best in the old Aesop fable, please all, please none. I will briefly tell it uh, in case there are folks who don't know it. Um, basically, there's a father and his son, and they are going out to market with their donkey. The tale begins with the son aboard the donkey. They pass a group of villagers who say, that's elder abuse. So the child gets off, the father gets on. They pass the next group of villagers who say, that's child abuse. So, we, so next, both people are riding father and son on the donkey, pass a group of villagers, that's animal abuse, and the story ends with the father and son carrying the donkey and they all fall into the river and they never make it to market. And the moral of the story is please all, please none. And for me, the fact that the animal in this story is a donkey could not be better placed if I would have invented it myself because that, of course, is the mascot of the Democratic Party and this, in a sense, please all, please none, or what I like to call milk toast messaging has been the standard on the left and it has not worked. Because in fact, what we find a good message does is not even test well with the opposition, which is I'm sure a phrase you have heard on calls like these, but in fact, engage the base in order to persuade the middle and actually alienate the opposition. Now the reason that you want to actually see some alienation from your opposition is multifold. The first is because Honestly, when you say a thing that actually engages your base, and as you're about to see, it tends to alienate your opposition. Even if you're not intending to do that, that is just a side effect of actually speaking your truth. Third, second, it's a way of assuring that your messages are actually progressive. Because again, if someone is your committed opposition, and I really want to underscore that phrase, committed opposition, we're not talking about, oh, they're Republican. We're talking about people who, in a cluster analysis, a battery of questions about the origin of wealth, the origin of poverty, whether or not this is a remediable um, public policy problem, 
disagrees with us at every single turn, why would we want them to be agreeing with something we are saying? That must mean that what we're saying is inherently not progressive. The third reason is because you want to create your coalition of support, the we, between the base and the persuadables. And that then becomes common sense, the way the world works, the way everyone thinks, rather than this fringe position, which of course is the position of our opponents. Turn it back to you, Linda. So that is exactly uh, where we started. We decided, um, and we did these dog groups, which are getting people's moment-to-moment -moment reactions. And the interesting thing about dog groups is we got both their unconscious reaction and their conscious reaction. So we asked people to dial their moment-to-moment re -moment reactions to messages, and then at the end to consciously rate the messages. And what's interesting is those ratings are, are not always the same. But we wanted to divide people into our base, <clears throat> our swing, and our persuadable. Our base, and this is just an example of that analysis, was 15% of the sample. They were this base was created based on their core value attitudes. They were more likely to be Democrats, more likely to be urban, more likely to be under poverty, more likely to be African American and Latino. <coughs> but they came out of three core questions that we used to divide our base and their base. Uh, our base believes that wealth is the product of luck. Their base believes that um, you work hard and you get wealthy. And people are actually divided on this question. Our base believe we could eliminate poverty. Their base believe we could not eliminate poverty. We would never be able to eliminate poverty. And the public at large is divided on that issue. And our base thinks it's a ridiculous notion that wealth creates prosperity for all. Their base believes that the wealthy do create prosperity for all, and the public overall is divided on those questions. So out of an analysis of core values, and we had a battery of about 15 core values, these three emerged as really dividing this space in an attitudinal way into their base, our base, and the opposition. Well, on that, I'll turn it to you for the opposition. Great. So the opposition, again, I want to underscore coincidentally, um, was almost the same size as our base. You saw a moment ago that we were 15%, they were 16%. That was not constructed on purpose. Um, if you all had to make a wild guess as to their demographics, I bet you'd guess exactly what's on the screen right here. Um, and they, again, have the opposite attitudes of what Celinda described. So these are the people who we can not get. Right? We could twist ourselves into the most incredible knots ever and have the milk toastiest messages that actually say nothing at all, that worship at the heels of the economy and that you know, say that maybe we should just treat people a little bit less crappy because then the economy will be happier. And maybe they won't hate the message, but it certainly won't advance our cause. So these are, these are what I like to call the sociopaths. And then we have the leftovers. Um, which in this sample is large because, you know, you add 16 and 15 percent and uh, you just, you have 31 and everyone else left over, 69 um, percent of the sample are, as Linda said, divided on these questions. These are the people that we are going after. These are the people whose minds we're trying to not just change but to keep toward our version of how the world works. So Linda, back to you for messages. So now comes the fun part. And the first thing we did was we tested several of their messages. We're showing one of them here. And you can see the, there are four lines that you're going to see and be able to watch throughout this dial exercise. The blue line is our base. The green line are the persuadable people who make up 65% of the population. Or no, uh, yes, about That's the media. Yes, 65%. Yeah, that is the mean, but they make up about two-thirds of the population. The red line, which is the opposition, and the activists who are our oversample of people active in this issue area. Let us play the message for you, and then we'll talk about what worked and what didn't work. All right, here we go with sound. 
Since our founding, people have come to America because it provides freedom and the promise that through hard work you can succeed. This has held true for generations. Only in America can someone come here with nothing, work hard, and become a success. This is not just an American dream, it's the American experience. It's up to the individual. And when you do work hard and get ahead, the government should not take your earnings and just give them to people who don't. We need to do everything we can to keep America's entrepreneurial spirit alive and encourage hard work so that people who want to succeed and prosper have the opportunity to do so. So the numbers in parentheses. This is Jeff. Just, uh, there were a couple questions. So as you explain this, can you remind people what the X and Y axes, axes are? And sure. talk a little bit within the context of your explanation about what the base is and how we define them. Okay. So uh, the x-axis is the time. So you can see the message go moment to moment. The y-axis is your rating of how convincing this message is to you. So you dial up when you like what you're hearing, you find it convincing, you dial down when you disagree with it, you don't find it convincing. The base, remember, was the 15% defined by their core attitudes. These are the people who believe that the wealthy do not create prosperity for everyone else, that we can end poverty, and that the wealthy have been lucky. Their base, of course, are the people who believe that you work hard for wealth, that wealth does create prosperity, and that we will never end poverty. So those are the two extremes, and the persuadable folks are the people in between on those core attitudes. In terms of the, um, if we turn to the next slide, uh, well, first of all, you'll see that this message uh, is very persuadable to the persuadables. They have an average rating of 65 uh, in their moment-to-moment -moment dials. Uh, so 65 is the rating on a scale of 0 to 100 in terms of how convincing it is. The base, our base, um, find it somewhat convincing and, uh, and kind of neutral. 57 is their mean. Our opposition, defined by their attitudes, find it very persuasive. This is, after all, their message. 76 on the average. And the activists at first aren't sure where it's going and then turn down immediately when they get a sense of what direction it is, it is going in and find it very unpersuadable, uh, particularly when you come to the part about you should just work hard and, and government doesn't have a role. They're dialing down pretty aggressively. If we look at the next chart, so we had the moment-to-moment -moment reactions in the messages. The other thing we did was to ask people to consciously rate the message after they had heard the whole thing. And you can see that the opposition uh, loves this message. This is, after all, their message. So they're giving it an average rating of 80. The persuadables, who actually found some things more persuadable than they were realizing, so their unconscious reactions were being triggered by some of these messages, but gave it a rating after the fact of only 44. Our base, which actually had been fairly neutral on it, said, no, 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 I wasn't fairly neutral on it. Only 27% said it was convincing. I give it a rating of 27%. Um, and those are 27% who give it a rating of 80 to 100 on a scale from 0 to 100. So people are, the opposition is responding as strongly as they actually did. The persuadables in the base are being much more modest in their reactions than they actually did. And the activists say, I hated this from the get-go. Only 5% said it was convincing. Now, actually, for about half the message, they had been fairly neutral on it. But they remembered it by the end as being completely unconvincing to them. The things that worked in this message is it was more aspirational. And even though the negative labels work, what we found repeatedly is that people wanted to be more aspirational. Um, and they feel like, I already know the problems. I want to know what we're, where we're headed, what we're going to do about it. We tested this against an anti, a pure anti-government approach. And while we're not going to take time to show that to you today, you can get access to that data. And it does outperform their traditional approaches. It also co-ops the American dream, which is a very, very strong icon to people. And it uses some very effective values. 
entrepreneurial spirit, the individual, uh, and freedom. And all of those values are very powerful to the public, particularly the persuadable public. And in fact, uh, in other analysis we've done, freedom is the single value that the right uses more than the left does. And it is, right now, rated the number one value in this country. So that is not a trivial uh, gap. There are some shortfalls. It's slow to build up. Uh, it, you'll see later that we will measure success by messages that grab you right away. This does not grab people right away. And in the end, it's only mildly persuasive. So then, let's turn to our top testing message. This is family comes first. We delivered this message with two different spokespeople. You're going to see the spokesperson. The me first, you're going to see the measurements with the woman of color delivering the message. We also delivered this message uh, from a white man. And what's really interesting is the message was equally persuasive from a woman of color and a white man to the base and the persuadable and the activist, but it was more alienating to their opposition. It was even more insulting uh, when a woman of color delivered the message, which is exactly the situation you want to be in. We want to reveal them for who they really are. And in fact, in this work and a number of other studies that we have done together with Anat, we have found repeatedly uh, that all you have to do is have a woman's voice, a mention women, uh, mention equality, um, mention that women getting ahead, and you will see uh, their side dial down pretty dramatically pretty fast. Um, and the rest of the public liking that completely, persuadable and our base liking those kinds of messages and those kinds of spokespeople quite, quite, rapid, uh, quite dramatically. So let's look at what happens with this message as people are actually hearing it. They may drive you crazy, but everyone knows family comes first. Whether it's for that newborn you swear already smiles, your elderly mom, or your spouse who got laid off, providing for your family and being there when they need you isn't negotiable. Every working parent should get paid enough to care for their kids and set them off toward a great future. If politicians want to talk family values, it's time they start valuing families, and that means making sure America's dedicated strivers and builders make ends meet. We work in order to make the future brighter for our kids and more secure for our families. Hardworking Americans deserve to make more than a decent living. They deserve to have a decent life. So first of all, we find that this is very persuadable to the persuadables. Uh, 71.5 average subconscious rating. Our base loves this message, 77.9%. The opposition uh, likes it too until we get uh, to a key point, and then they dial down. Uh, so they're divided on this message. And the key point, who would have guessed, is the language working parents should get paid enough to care for their children and set them off to a bright future. Now, who would have imagined that if we want to really drive the right wing crazy, we would say that uh, to drive them crazy? And part of our hypothesis is that probably working parents connotes uh, working moms to many on the right. Um, but that is hardly a controversial notion with the public in general. Our activists like this message a lot, although you notice that first, they're dialing under the base and persuadable. And part of that is because our activists aren't really sure who's using family for what. They support families, but they think that they associate that rhetoric more with the right wing than with our side. In real people's minds, and we've studied this a lot in both focus groups and these dials, um, people have a love family. And they love putting family first, and they don't want to judge who's in your family. And they think there are all kinds of families, and families are difficult enough as it is. Let's not be judging who's in anybody else's family. And they don't uh, have just a father knows best notion of family anymore. So this family comes first, and this is the third piece of work where we have used this messaging 
uh, we work with a knot on another project on um, work and family messaging. And this is a very, very strong notion. The second thing that's really exciting about this language is it includes the notion of a newborn and the elderly. And that addition is very strong because um, that is the real caregiving responsibility of people today. And it brings in some of the older voters who respond very strongly to that cross-generational appeal. Um, in terms of the actual messaging here, the things that are the conscious reactions, you'll notice the opposition does not like it. They think, I liked it even less than I thought. Persuadables remain highly persuaded at 60%. And the base adores this message, as do the activists, at 83 and 73 percent. So these are very, very strong messages. People love the details of real lived experience. And remember, that goes back to one of our basic findings on the labeling. It has a very, very quick takeoff. Uh, people love that language about they may drive you crazy, but everyone knows family comes first. Uh, people just love that language. Um, so this is a very strong message, turned out to be our top message, that's all of the things you would want, um, except the activists need to warm up a little to it initially uh, when they're figuring out who the heck is using family. Is this our side or theirs? The last thing I'll show you about this messaging is that you can see the dials here of the woman of color messenger and notice that the opposition um, even lower and having a lower mean when it's a woman of color. So a woman of color is saying that working parents should have a bright, should work to provide a bright future uh, for their children. Highly controversial with the right wing. Who would have thought it? And um, a, a great way to distance them and reveal them for who they really are and what their policies uh, really are. Our second strongest message was community. And um, you'll see again, very, very strong here with the base strong with the activists, fast takeoff, very persuasive to people, uh, a little less alienating of the opposition, but still a very strong message. And you see here the message delivered. We delivered it with both a white woman and a white man. And you'll see the dolls for the white woman. Our country's strength is grounded in our ability to work together. We are stronger when we recognize we rise or fall united, and are weaker when greed insists we be left to fend for ourselves. You and I know our society is at its best when we grant every striver the opportunity to fulfill their potential and pursue their dreams. The USA cannot stand for you stand alone, but must stand for us. America succeeds when every worker is paid enough to care for his or her family, when every entrepreneur has the tools to make their vision a reality, and when every American can retire in dignity. America works with us when we look out for each other and work together as one nation, indivisible. So this message um, has um, a very quick takeoff, very convincing to persuadables, both in their conscious remembrance of it and their actual moment-to-moment -moment dials. It shows the true colors of the opposition. And who knew that after you say, that working parents uh, should be able to work, when they work, should be able to guarantee a bright future for their children. Who knew that that was a seditious statement? The second most seditious thing you can say is that every worker is paid enough. And the opposition, er, real people dial up dramatically on this. The opposition dials down on it, even though they come right back up when we talk about entrepreneurship. This message also strong in being able to co-opt the entrepreneurship value that we saw earlier in the opposition messaging was quite strong. It also taps into young and old because it talks about retirement. And that addition has been quite, quite strong in these poverty messages. And the other thing that's quite strong about this message is that it attacks greed. And you will see throughout this data that attacking greed, attacking CEOs, very, very strong language for the public, but alienates the opposition. They don't like uh, greed being attacked. Other people uh, to respond strongly uh, to greed being attacked. Again, we see this message equally strong from a white woman and a white man. Uh, but what is great is that when the white woman is talking, their side 
dials down even lower and particularly hates a woman attacking breeze. So wonderful that we're getting this um, gender interaction with our messages um, that is really revealing the other side for who they are and also uh, that uh, our messages to the persuadables and to our base testing equally strong independent of the messenger. The next message we talked about is very, very exciting. And this is the entirely new metaphor that Anat developed. And she gave you some of the original intellectual underpinnings of it. But this new way to talk about poverty as container. And it turned out to be a resounding success. It resonates extremely strongly with the base and the persuadable. It's very alienating to the opposition and the activists adore it from the beginning. So let's play the message from you coming this time from a white woman and you'll and mentioning gender, which is an extra sin to the right wing, and you'll see um, how the moment to moment dials are. Wake up at four thirty, take two buses to work, meals you can't afford, get home after the kids are asleep to come up short at the end of the month. Especially in industries where women work with wages held down, a regular schedule, and child care that costs a paycheck, most women can't pull ahead, no matter how hard we try. Corporations have taken advantage of us, raking in profits by cutting everything our families need to survive. We need to get women off this treadmill of work that doesn't pay the bills, so moms can see their kids, customers have money to spend in our stores, and all of us can come together to build stronger communities. When we do right by women, communities prosper. It's time we got America back on track by changing the rules about work and wages. So this message alienated the opposition. They didn't like it when they were subconsciously dialing on it, and they really hate it when they remembered it. Only 13% found it very convincing. Uh, it, the right wing hates anything that is gender. And the overt gender work messaging here works extremely well with the base, the swing, and the activists, but alienates completely the opposition. The ability to use gender in this way is very, very powerful right now. The persuadable liked the message, 49% convincing. The base loved it, and the activists loved it. Um, the message is not quite as persuadable as we would like. It's 49% persuadable. Uh, part of that may be that there were some new things to people in here and some new ways of talking about things so we don't get the familiarity effect. What people did find extremely persuasive was referencing um, real lived experience and real language, like skipping meals you can't afford, getting home after the kids are asleep. And that really resonates with women who really like the descriptions, not in theoretical terms. Too much of this debate about poverty and gaps and inequality it's too theoretical for women. Women like it when it's discussed in real lived experience. This message was also very artful in terms of tapping into the values of freedom and prosperity. And that resonated strongly with the activists, the base, and of the persuadables. And again, as we've noted, being able to use that value of freedom, very, very important. This one does have a little bit slower spark and isn't quite as strong with the base as the other messages, but it's still a great new uh, approach that is quite alienating to the opposition. We also tested this message with and without explicit reference to gender. And the nice thing is the opposition was even more alienated when gender was explicitly mentioned, but everybody else reacted exactly the same to it, including men and women, white uh, people of color, all reacted the same. Uh, in fact, whites were slightly higher uh, when we talked explicitly about gender because white women uh, were more responsive. So explicit gender references gets women even more engaged, doesn't alienate men, but does alienate the right-wing opposition. And it's very, very successful in that way. There were a variety of other kinds of messaging here. And we don't have time for everything, but we thought to give you just a few quick insights from some of the other messages, including, um, and we'll, you'll have to look at your leisure at it, 
uh, that one of our favorite things was we actually took on capitalism. Thank you, Jeff, for letting us attack capitalism. And it was remarkably successful. Not quite as successful as our first messages, um, but uh, very, very successful, which was kind of fun and very rewarding. So in terms of other things that we want to remember and take away from this, calling out CEOs' wealthy greed, very important part of the strategy. It motivates our base. It resonates with the activists. It is highly persuasive to people, and it's very alienating. Uh, to the opposition. They don't like greed being blamed, and they don't like corporations being blamed. And we found, for example, that people dialed down when they heard things like the greedy few who rigged the game, wealthy America, where the rest of America was, yeah, you're exactly right. So populism is alive and well. It is very, very strong, and we want to be sure to incorporate populism in our uh, debate about um, in our conversation about poverty, and it often isn't um, incorporated enough. It's also uh, abstraction works against us. We talked already about real lived experience. It's also better to create images and create metaphors. So one of our better language was letting a handful of rich corporate bosses line their pockets with wealth our labor produces. Now that may sound like Marxist too. Uh, it's actually a not shank or two, but it tested <laughs> very well with the public. Um, and um, they, they like that real lived experience described. If there is an opium of the messaging right now, it is the middle class. Uh, everybody wants to write middle class into every messaging. And uh, it is strong with the public. The problem is it isn't distinguishing. Uh, and we have done two studies now, this one with the not and a separate one that we did actually with the Republican pollster, where the Republican wrote all of the middle class messages from the right, and they tied our messages. Um, middle class is universally strong, which makes it less useful because it doesn't um, energize our base particularly, and it doesn't alienate the opposition. And in fact, um, we, they have um, middle class statements that are as strong as our middle class statements, including some statements that actually attack the poor. Um, so middle class is an opiate, but it's not doing what we want to do here, which is to make a distinction, draw a contrast that is a winning contrast for us, but that leads people to action and that distinguishes between good policies and bad. The last thing that we looked at was inequality. And uh, we looked at inequality from two different perspectives, racial and gender. It is much easier, honestly, to talk about gender inequality right now than racial inequality in our society. Um, and um, we found that when you reference gender inequality, um, it was very powerful uh, to voters and actually very alienating to the other side. This distinction in terms of being easier and to talk about gender inequality than racial inequality includes even among our base and among activists. Now people of color obviously respond very strongly to language about uh, race, uh, particularly African Americans. Uh, but they respond strongly whether or not you explicitly refer to race, which is not saying that we're arguing not to refer to race. It's just to inform our own understanding. So references to two Americas with or without race, for example, equally strong with people of color. But when we ex refer to it explicitly uh, with race, we had a decline among whites, including among white women. And unfortunately, we're still not in a place where the white women who respond to the gender inequality message are sensitized to respond to the racial inequality message. The other thing we found that was quite interesting is that Latinas, Latinos are very responsive, men and women, to gender inequality statements. There had been a time where Latinos were not as responsive to gender-based messaging. That time is gone. And what we found was that women and men in the Latino community very responsive to gender inequality. 
very responsive to racial inequality as well. The sad news is on the racial inequality piece is that the people who are uh, very responsive to racial inequality are also very responsive to gender inequality. Unfortunately, the people who are responsive to gender inequality, which is a bigger number, are not all equally responsible to responsive to racial inequality. And that's obviously something I think all of us on this call uh, committed to working on, but something that we need to think about as we uh, develop our messaging. So let me turn it back to Anat and Jeff for closing remarks, and then open it up to all of your good questions. Um, so just a couple of quick clarification points in case um, anybody's confused. We did test messages with uh, Man of Color Voice as well on the four-pager handout that Jeff referenced at the top of the call. You'll see a fourth message that also very, very strong, just a question of time um, in terms of how many things uh, we could show you. Um, the other thing that I want to say just by way of kind of rounding out is that what is as interesting perhaps about what is in these messages is what is not in these messages. And just as none of these messages are sort of panned to the middle class, as Linda mentioned, for the reasons that she mentioned, that we're actually seeing an inverse correlate with the efficacy of moving people towards our policy solutions when we um, make them uh, an argument about the middle class. They are also not about what the economy wants or needs. And you'll see that appealing to and discussing what people want and need is incredibly effective, incredibly progressive, and persuasive. So with that, I would like to thank Anat and Selenda. And we will move to uh, your questions. I have quite a few questions here. And I'm just going to say right off the top, if I don't get to them all, I will try to come back and uh, email some answers to people who had um, uh, questions that we did not get to. So the first question, there's quite a few people, Selinda and Anat, who are interested in this question of alienating the opposition. One question was, won't that uh, have the effect of immobilizing the opposition? And then there were other uh, inquiries about digging into this a little bit more. And before you kick it off and not, um, I would also clarify for people that the, eight, that the opposition as defined by the metrics we had in this survey instrument uh, it constitutes about 16 to 17 percent of the population. So this is not defining the opposition in a way where we are giving up on, in any way, a large portion of the winnable, persuadable populace. Una? Yeah, so it's a great question in terms of activating them. Part of the answer lies in what Jeff already said, which is that we're talking about people with really, really strident, hardcore, very um, tightly formed beliefs, and they tend to be more activist anyway, so we're kind of already faced with that and down that road. But the larger answer to that question is actually perhaps counterintuitively, yes, we do want to mobilize them even more to tell their truth, because what we find is that when they couch their attitudes in the you know, more benign language of the message that we tested, more people are persuaded by it. But when we actually tell our truth and we say really controversial, and I hope you can hear the dripping sarcasm, things like every working parent should be paid enough to set their kids off to a bright future, if that sets them off, then what we want is for them to say, no, they shouldn't. That's not true. That's terrible. Because we know that if that's the fight, that most people are on our side. And that's where if we set them off on those things, if they're arguing against those things, that's precisely the public discussion that we want to have. And then uh, the next question that several the people asked. I would say, by the way, um, one thing if I could just add to that, Jeff, I don't think we're, I, I don't know where all the folks on the call live, but in the world I live, particularly right now, we're not suffering from any lack of mobilization on the other side, to be honest with you. And I think, Jeff, you said a very important thing. If, if the opposition were defined as 45% of the public and we were getting them all fired up, I would be much more worried. But 17% um, that, you know, are the Tea Party folks showing up at town halls and stuff like that, we need to isolate them. So um, I think that's 
those would be, you know, they're already fired up, honestly. And we need to isolate them so that they don't reach out to the next 65%. Thank you. The next question, um, which also came from a couple of people, is about tax sensitivity. And the question is uh, both whether we tested tax sensitivity in the context of taxes on corporations or taxes on the wealthy, and uh, if we didn't, how? What would you suppose would be the impact based upon other research that you have undertaken? Oh yeah, that's um, a really super good question. Oh, go ahead. No, um, I, either either direction. You can you can take it. Uh, that's a really good question. We actually have tested it that way. This was just taxes increase your taxes. So uh, it was deliberately, uh, I mean, people are wildly in favor of increasing taxes on corporations and having the wealthy pay their fair share. And we have tested that. Um, it works better with programs like Medicare and education, but even uh, programs that are overtly framed as poverty programs is quite popular. Uh, but the reality is, um, while we want to have this tax fairness dialogue, and it fits into the narrative that we were talking about at the end, the populist narrative that we're not using enough. A lot of times, frankly, voters, when they hear us talk about these programs, are nervous that we're going to increase their taxes, not just the corporation. The only thing I would add to that is we spend entirely too much time talking about taxes and too little time talking about the things that taxes pay for. Uh, when was the last time you walked into a Mac store and they said, look at the price, look at the amazing price, look at the price. You fall in love with the object and then let's talk about what it costs. We don't need to be leading our appeals with the price tag. Nobody sells a product like that. And so I'm not saying to run screaming from the taxes argument, but I am saying that come every April 15th, I am mystified by the fact that we all make it our business to do these huge tax, tax actions because frankly, the day of my root canal is not the day that I want to celebrate how awesome dentists are. Two weeks later, or more pointedly, on the day that every kid returns to school, that's when I'd like to be celebrating taxes because the day that my kid goes into public school, you best believe that I'm feeling some serious love for public spending. So the next question, uh, which is a very good one uh, as well, is uh, what about the word striver? They want to know, uh, did it resonate because it seems a little artificial? And uh, could you both react to that a little bit? This is about our search for a positive label. Yeah. Um, so we, I, we tried every positive label under the sun. I'm exaggerating, but not by much because CCC and Enceland and I and, and um, Jonathan wanted to find something positive to say, and so we tried many permutations. As Linda mentioned, um, we didn't get a lot of traction. The thing that was most popular as an isolated label was working for family. Within, embedded inside of the messages, um, People were less reactive to it, meaning that it flowed and sort of it didn't cause a dial down, except interestingly with activists. So um, this question is very, very well placed. Um, activists were really thinking a lot about it and assessing how other people were hearing it, which is sort of you know a side effect of getting a bunch of really, really smart people who think about persuasion and communication to take your dial. Um, they're not just thinking about how they feel, they're thinking about how other people might feel at the same time, the split brain thing going on. Um, so I think it's, you know, we're, we're having some sort of, whenever you introduce new terminology, uh, you always get a lower rating because people rate more highly things that are familiar. We just, we have a familiarity bias built into our brains. And so we are coming at a disadvantage. So frankly, to see it performing as well as it does is kind of heartening given that it's not language that's really out there. I think the one other thing I would say about it is that it is a notion that does connect people who are at or below the poverty line with the people who are just within spitting distance of it, one paycheck away from poverty, which again, you know, as Jeff said at the top, 33% of our country is 
at 200% of the poverty line below that, staggering. And, you know, it might actually be a way of creating a new constituency back in the place of identity politics where we all sort of identify with this notion that we are trying really, really hard to go, you know, to be Sisyphus and to get uh, this boulder up a rock, up a mountain. So the next question is, um, can you talk a little bit, so it's this, off balance and off kilter seem kind of vague, and the question is, did we test messages that actually describe the causes, such as anti-regulation or anti-worker um, uh, policies? The answer to that is yes, but I would like, um, you know, perhaps Celinda to take a shot at how contextualizing this makes a big difference in its receptivity. Yeah, so I think that's right, although honestly I think Anand should probably answer this because she's more the cognitive expert, but um, the thing of it is um, actually it may seem vague, but it is the kind of language that people themselves, particularly women, uh, use to describe what's going on. So the number one word that women use right now to describe the economy is instability up and down, up and down. Um, and the number one thing that people say that they, the women say they want in their life right now is balance, stability, security. So I'll have um, Anant talk about the contextualization, but actually this language, which may seem a little vague, is actually building on a cognitive frame that is quite strong, particularly for women right now. Yeah, I guess the only thing that I would add is We've decided that the gap doesn't feel vague, but that's, again, that's pure familiarity bias. You know, the notion, oh, of, the notion of being able to sort of see and hold in your brain and um, imagine differences of wealth and income between demographic groups as being like a division in horizontal space, we have all been taught that as a way of thinking, that is no more natural to our brains than is thinking about it as um, uh, an imbalance. So I guess what I would say is, you know, practice. Uh, yeah. Great. The next question is By the what way, I will tell you this, um, and one thing, Jeff, if I may say, this word balance and imbalance is testing really, really well in a variety of places. So we just used it in immigration messaging, and we had worked on some immigration messaging. It tests extremely well there. We, test, we just tested it in responses on Obamacare. It tested very well there. This balance notion is actually a very strong notion with voters right now. Could you each uh, take a minute and uh, describe uh, anything in the research that really, really surprised you? That's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll go first so I can steal Celinda's, <laughs> so I can make sure she doesn't steal mine. Um, I'll tell you, we were frankly shocked at the lack of drop-off um, for the non-white male messenger, and that includes um, a woman of color, a white woman, and man of color, which you didn't get to hear today, but we did test. Uh, normally, you get um, almost or around and sometimes even more than a 10-point drop. Um, and you get a drop disappointingly, for example, with white women very often when it's a non-white male messenger because it just sort of doesn't sound like the voice of authority. And in fact, I will say we were so surprised that we actually redid the testing with images because although um, in experimentation uh, that's held consistent over decades, people 85% um, of the time correctly guess the race of a voice um, just by hearing it. We thought maybe people weren't properly hearing the race of our people. Maybe that's why we're not seeing a difference. How is this possible? It, it just doesn't make any sense. So we redid a subsample that was statistically significant in order to check with pictures just to really, you're looking, a black woman is talking. <laughs> and still, the only people that really had a drop off 
um, that really disliked the messages more were the people that didn't like the messages to begin with, i.e. our opposition. And in fact, un not surprisingly, activists, and to a certain extent the base, actually liked the messages better um, from a non-white male messenger. So that was surprising. That really surprised me. Um, a second thing that really surprised me was what alienated the opposition. Um, this notion of, um, I'm just stunned, honestly, at how gender sensitive they are. And I am stunned that con concepts like, you know, we think we're going to co-opt everybody and define this debate by using middle class, which is like opium. Actually, where we're going to really win this thing is by driving them crazy with such controversial statements as, uh, you know, uh, workers being paid decently and working parents uh, being able to, if they're working, to guarantee their kids a good future and greed. I mean, these are just, these are normative values in our culture right now, and yet it, it drives them crazy. And, you know, it just occurs to me we're just not using this strongly enough. Um, we're not pushing their buttons enough, and uh, so that was both fun and surprising. And then I will tell you why I absolutely adored it, and I loved Anat and Jeff for wanting to test it. I had not thought we would be very successful taking on capitalism, and I was really <laughs> psyched that it worked as well as it did. Okay, while well, we got you on this topic, Selinda, there's a question about you, asking for a little more on what do we think it is in the opposition that is being triggered that drives them so nuts that the midpoint of that family message where we start talking about those concepts that you just described. Can you make a guess as to what's going on in people's brains there or not? Um, uh, uh, I, oh, go ahead. No, no, you go. I, honestly, I'm not sure, but I think a couple of things. I think that there are changes in our society that are just facts and that normal people just think of as facts. Real people are just like, yeah, this is the way it is, that are driving the right wing crazy. And I think some of this language triggers that. Um, so. Uh, you know, things, any, some of the gender sensitivity, I think, is because I do think working parents triggered more working moms, um, and I think they think that moms should still be home. Um, you know, we know that um, uh, the right, 80 percent of the right believes uh, that the men should be the head of the household, um, and some things like this. So I think it's, it's triggering gender role changes that have occurred in our society that are deeply alienating to them and they often don't get to vote. And I think they're reading them into it. I think that they really are um, pro-business and anti-government. And so they are not liking anything that they think uh, we might ensure something. And we want to make sure that X generates Y. They like, they believe in the randomness of things. Um, at a fundamental level, and you know, in some cases, the randomness is solved only in a religious framework. In some cases, the randomness in chaos isn't solved at all. But I think they believe in the chaos theory. They don't want to put order. They don't want to have guarantees. Um, they don't believe in it at some kind of fundamental psychological level. But having said that, I start out by saying I was profoundly stunned uh, at the level of it. What I would add, um, some of some of it is echoing, Linda. Some of it is maybe a, a slightly different take. Uh, the thing I would really underscore is what is when you look across all of the messages at the moments where they consistently check out, and in some cases where you know you think you're giving them carpal tunnel because they can't dial down fast enough, um, it's it's things that have to do with setting standards. Um, anything that has to do with sort of imposed standard, and I assume that that's reactivity to government, as Linda said, so I very much agree with that. The larger point about change, you know, in emerging research, and I think this is something we really have not paid enough attention to, 
the number one correlate to a conservative ideology is not as people would guess, which is, you know, that you're more progressive if you have a heightened tendency towards empathy. That is certainly a factor, but the number one sort of psychological disposition that correlates most closely, and Don Jost does a lot of this work at NYU, is what we call tolerance of ambiguity, which is just a fancy way of saying how good are you at handling change. And so what we find is that people who answer sort of psychological batteries along lines of like, I need tomorrow to be you know, the same as today, I need to be able to count on what's going to happen, I keep a tight-knit circle of friends throughout life, I don't you know, feel comfortable in new situations, I prefer to eat the same food more often than not, et cetera, et cetera, you know, what, from the mundane to sort of the more profound, the more uh, conservative you are, the less you tolerate ambiguity and change. And so if you think about the moment that we're sitting in, as a moment of change on every single level, whether it be climatic and weather, gender roles, sexuality, technology, I mean, you know, I'm talking to you all from a tiny little object, and you all are sitting everywhere imaginable in this country. Um, it's staggering, right? And so if for you the way that you're internally wired is that that is terrifying and that that is sort of a thing to run from and be feared, then, you know, you're not going to be comfortable in, in the world. You're going to be sort of clutching at and clawing for what it is you hold dear and what you know um, and not reaching out to sort of seek new things and and be excited about difference, whether it be racial, whether it be sort of gender role. And so at the risk of getting too philosophical here for you toward the end of the call, I really think that the place where we haven't spent enough time in thinking about messaging more broadly is how do we make people not just comfortable with, but actually excited about change and how do we sort of play up and nurture their desire for, you know, ambiguity and, and interest and, you know, kind of today, tomorrow being an incredible mystery where anything could happen. Anat, there are several questions about the container. Can you just um, kind of go back over what the container metaphor is, like what is the container in the story, how it yeah. operates, why it works as a narrative? Sure, and I just, in case it's not obvious, and if it is obvious, my apologies for, you know, trying to be careful with research. At no point when we're discussing metaphor are we actually intending to be overt. So just as, you know, none of us would say, like, inequality is horizontal distance, or, you know, emotion is food. Like, we don't make our metaphors overt, we evoke them through language. So I'm not actually suggesting you say, the literal phrase, poverty as a container. And in fact, poverty as a word is not that effective. You'll notice that we didn't actually make reference to it in the messages. It doesn't really work. Um, so what we're talking about is terminology, phrases, and images that suggest that some sort of barricade is present. And so we can use this both to talk about conditions of poverty, and we can use it to talk about inequality. When we talk about inequality, we can use language like a barrier, an obstacle, um, though I wouldn't recommend this term. The notion of being marginalized is, of course, also a barrier. And so what the barrier or the container is, is the set of public policies, the set of decisions that we've made, whether they be choices about, you know, not letting, uh, not having the real wage budge in decades while the cost of living continues to go up and up and up, um, decisions about having student loan debt, you know, I'm just picking ones at random, we could have a long list, um, go spiraling out of control and become increasingly unreachable for um, the vast majority of Americans, you know, et cetera, for child care, et cetera, for retirement, et cetera, for health care. Um, so those are sort of the impediments. And the idea with a barrier or with a container is that in general, our default understanding of those things are that they are constructed objects, which means it's not like the Grand Canyon. Basically, God didn't put it there. <laughs> Somebody built it. And when you're on the wrong side of a barrier, even if it's just being stuck on the Bay Bridge, um, it's not you, right? You can't get to your meeting on time because there's a very, very long line of cars in front of you. 
And so the notion is that we're bringing to the fore in the story the idea that of causation and that the person who is experiencing the condition is striving, again, to get back to that word, is struggling, is living on the brink. Um, all of these are sort of evocations of barrier and container. But something is actually impeding them. It's not just their own sort of lack of attention or their lack of trying or their lack of smarts actually is a thing that keeps them. So does that do justice to the question? Thank you. Um, this is a very specific question, and if you don't, either of you doesn't have it at your fingertips, I will dig into and get it for this person. But the question is, what portion of unmarried women are already in our base, and what percentage are persuadable? Oh, the unmarried women under 55 are disproportionately in our base, but let me get you those numbers, Jeff, and I'll send them. Unmarried women over 55 who tend to be widows are um, uh, disproportionately in the swing, but I'll get you those numbers. Thanks. Uh, and that, so this question is for you to please expand on priming people with money and how it makes them more selfish. And the questioner is particularly interested in how this operates in the climate debate, the context being you know, people fearful that action to address climate will run into, you know, don't take away my big screen lifestyle attitudes. Right. OK. So first, let me explain um, the experimental process. So unconscious priming, for those of you who don't know, is where we expose people um, it could be to a word, it could be to an image, it could be to um, a sound, it could be to a color, uh, so quickly that they don't consciously register. So they couldn't tell you that they'd seen it, but we know that they've registered it um, uh, subconsciously. And then you can measure a whole host of things. It sort of depends on the experiment. You can measure their behavior. And so in the experiment that I was describing, you know, <laughs> half the sample would actually um, everybody would be staring at a green dot or a blue dot. Um, some people would have uh, really, really big num uh, you know, numbers with a dollar sign or money-related words, um, sometimes just really large numbers, a series of experiments, um, flashed before them. Some people would not. They would just be staring at a green dot passively. And then the experimenter walks into the room with um, a whole bunch of pencils in a cup. And what we find is that the primed people when he or she you know, spills them, picks up fewer than half as many pencils as the unprimed person. They also will place their chairs twice as far apart. So you say to them, oh, now for the next part of the experiment, um, we're going to have a conversation with you. Could you just set up these two chairs? They'll place their chairs twice as far apart um, in inches as the unprimed people. So what that means is that um, by activating this sort of higher level reasoning in the brain, which we can also see through, you know, testing where we're actually looking at blood flow. Don't worry, it's painless. Um, we can see sort of where the blood is going in the brain. And basically, in order to process really large numbers, and I will shock you to say, when I say really large numbers, I actually mean any number that's greater than 150. Because we have evolved to be able to distinguish 150 things in our visual plane. For those of you who are familiar with management literature, you'll know that that's kind of a magical number in terms of group size. It's not coincidental. So numbers larger than that, we can perform mathematical operations on them, of course. And, and some of you are very adept <laughs> at performing mathematical operations on really big numbers. Um, but we can't sort of cognitively experience them in the way that, say, you know, there are three cups on the table. Like, I know exactly what that looks like. I know what that would feel like. Um, so what we're doing to people is we're sort of taking them out of their experience brain or their emotional brain, if you will, and sending them up into their kind of, what do I think? Do I agree? Do I disagree? What's the study? What's the evidence? And when people are hanging out in that space, they are primed to be contentious, and they're primed to doubt, and they're primed to sort of question and second guess, and not just sort of feel 
the emotional resonance and impact of what we're saying. This is a big part of the reason why I'm sure a lot of you have been admonished over time to use what we call social math. So instead of saying, you know, X million people, we say the population of New York City or, you know, seven bus loads full of children or whatever, kind of a thing that is more you, something you could imagine. Um, what was the rest of the question, Jeff? So that's priming with numbers. No, I think that's very helpful. And uh, with that, we are officially at 2.30. I want to thank everybody for joining us, and I want to thank our presenters. Anat and Selinda, who did a fabulous job. If any of you have further questions or follow-up, we will be happy to uh, get you additional data points or answer your questions. My email address is in the PDF summary, and you have, by virtue of joining this webinar, um, other CCC email addresses, and I am assured that emails that you send out will make their way towards me, and I can share them with Anat and Selinda to get your questions answered and um, you know allow us to dig into our uh, database to find out what uh, the um, answer to your question is. Thank you again everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.